Frequency Podcast Network. Stories that matter, podcasts that resonate. As Americans vote today, the entire world is watching to see if Donald Trump can somehow return to the White House. And aside from Americans, there are millions of people around the world holding their breath at the thought of what a Trump presidency means for their country. Perhaps none more so than Ukrainians. In two weeks, we will mark 1,000 days since Russia invaded Ukraine and since Ukrainians resisted so fiercely. But the situation now on the ground reportedly is dire for the defenders. And one of the two choices for U.S. president has vowed to settle the conflict, a term many believe to mean attempting to force Ukraine to accept a deal that would give large chunks of that country to Russia. I will prevent, and very easily, World War III, very easily. Before I even arrive at the Oval Office, I will have the disastrous war between Russia and Ukraine settled. It will be settled quickly. quickly. Now, 1,000 days is a long time. And it is difficult for any so-called regional conflict to stay in the eyes of the world consistently for that long. Especially when the news cycle moves so quickly and effortlessly to the next conflict or the next disaster. So what does today's election mean for the future of Ukraine as a country? What is happening on the ground right now while the eyes of the world are elsewhere? Does Ukraine still have hope of a victory? And critically for all of us, is this about to become more than just a regional conflict? I'm Jordan Heath-Rawlings. This is The Big Story. Dr. Balkan Devlin is the director of the Transatlantic Program and senior fellow at the McDonald Laurier Institute. He is also an expert forecaster for Good Judgment Incorporated. He is one of the people we rely on to parse out how world events impact the future. Hey, Balkan. Hello, Jordan. It's great to be back. Why don't you start uh, by telling us, obviously, uh, tonight is the American election. How critical is what happens in the States over the next 48 hours, week or so, uh, to the future of Ukraine? It's, it's a great question. And... Although I think in the short term, it may have drastic consequences. In the medium to long term, I think the primary determinant of how the war in Ukraine ends, whether it will end in Ukrainian victory or a forced settlement that benefits Russia, uh, will fundamentally come down to whether our European allies managing to step up to the plate and continue to defend Europe against Russian onslaught, regardless of what happens in in the U.S. elections. But of course, there is a a serious concern and a variety of opinion, uh, both in Europe as well as in Ukraine, uh, when it comes to the election results. What it means if Donald Trump wins, what it means if uh, Kamala Harris wins. And and you will be surprised to um, perhaps to hear that there is no one single opinion in terms of which one would be uh, more more beneficial uh, for Ukraine and U- Ukraine's war effort. Can you maybe explain for us um, at least what we know based on what they've said? What would differ between uh, Donald Trump and Kamala Harris in their approach to the conflict? Uh, should either one of them win? So Harris, uh, Harris campaign basically continues the Biden's uh, line uh, when it comes to supporting Ukraine, though their language shifts between, you know, as long as it takes to uh, whatever it takes. But the the policies themselves, uh, I would expect a continuation in terms of providing support for Ukraine. However, it also comes together with the with the problems of Biden's approach, which is incrementalist, risk averse, very much concerned with uh, with escalation and escalation management and engaging in a drip, drip, drip support um, for Ukraine, the, an issue that we have talked about a few times here on this on this podcast. So on paper and on action, the rhetoric is there that it will continue Biden's uh, Biden's policies. 
on the on the Trump side of things, you end up getting different uh, signals. Uh, you, on the one hand, people like J.D. Vance, who basically comes out as um, pretty anti-Ukrainian, I would say, in terms of whether the support would continue. Uh, Trump himself claims that he will be able to uh, reach a deal and 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 stop the war. And if Vladimir Putin doesn't listen to him, uh, he will uh, go in full in, which I find not necessarily very believable. So the the line though coming from the Trump surrogates, and depending on on who you talk to. Um, you also have the line saying that no, 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 no. Uh, you know, Trump administration will not necessarily throw um, Ukraine under the bus. Uh, that will be, you know, a position of uh, you know negotiating from strength, um, etc. But then you you look at what Trump himself says, and on these issues, he you know he's all over. And I would not be too surprised that if he would try to f- enforce some sort of a deal. I don't think he will be able to succeed in either case, uh, but it is uh, it is a concern, particularly for the European allies and, and Ukrainian uh, our Ukrainian friends, that they might be forced through a Trump administration uh, into the negotiating table through the threat of holding back support, and I think that's a very legitimate um, concern at this stage. Leaving aside uh, the American election and sort of talk of the future for a few minutes. How are Ukrainian troops uh, holding up on the ground right now? What is happening? Are they pushing forward? Are they struggling to maintain uh, their current positions? Like, give us a sense of what's actually going on. So the um, the situation in the battlefield is not looking particularly good for Ukraine. The Russians have been incrementally uh, advancing over the past few uh, months in Donbass, taking different um, you know, strategically located towns. The Ammunition uh, is coming through, but not on sufficient scale. The mobilization initially in Ukraine uh, provided more troops, but there is still now issues with mobilizing more personnel. And of course, Ukrainians are naturally uh, reluctant to ramp up uh, that particular mobilization if if the ammunition and the artillery shells and the and the weapons uh, will not be there. Why would you send your people to the meat grinder as as it goes? Um, there is increasing frustration, and rightfully so, on the Ukrainian side, that they are fighting with their you know hands tied to their backs when it comes to striking deeper into Russian territory in order to uh, inflict more damage and having to you know, bring the war um, to the you know, Russian uh, supply and logistics. But the situation in the battlefield does not look good. I mean, the, the strikes against civilian infrastructure um, and cities are increasing. It's probably highest in terms of about drone and, and missile strikes and, and gliding bombs. Definitely larger you know, numbers are coming through than it was the case in the past year and a half or two. So the situation uh, when you talk with, with, with the people on the ground and with people who are more, more familiar with the battle lines than I am, um, looks quite dire. Now, it doesn't mean that the Ukrainian front lines are is, is is about to collapse, and you know the Russians will push through um, to another blitzkrieg to Kiev. Uh, that doesn't mean uh, that, but it is a very very difficult time, and a difficult time coming up in winter with increasing strikes and Russians hunting civilians uh, in Kherson, using you know engaging literally what they the Russians would call safaris, hunting civilian population through drones, for example. So the situation both in the cities in on the civilian side as well as in the battlefield is not particularly good. You mentioned that uh, Ukraine is having problems being allowed to uh, use some of this equipment to strike deep into Russia. What happened to Ukraine's uh, summer offensive, as I remember it? And they managed to take several small towns sort of getting closer and closer into Russian territory. Is that are they still holding that? What's the state of uh, any kind of incursion on that side? If you mean the the, the Kursk, you know, um, infiltration into the Russian territory, from what I can follow, it is still holding, though you do have efforts to by the Russians to take uh, that that part back. However, uh, they seem to focus, the Russians seem to focus their uh, attacks and, and firepower and attention into Donbass and trying to break the lines there and, and capture the rest of Donbass that they are not um, controlling right now. Um, so the 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 situation on the ground is as such that uh, although there are some tactical level 
successes that comes with the incursion uh, of Ukrainian uh, troops into Russia in the Kursk region, they're not necessarily strategically making the the impact that Ukraine was hoping that it will, that is, you know, distract uh, Russian uh, and divert Russian resources away from the offensive in Donbass and towards Kursk, and that did not happen. In the meantime, there have also been reports that apparently have a number of allies concerned of North Korean troops reporting to Russia. What do we actually know about this situation and why would that be so concerning? I mean, there are two, well, at least three things that, that should concern concern us. Now, the number has changed, but it ranges anywhere from 3,000 to 12,000 troops in total by some accounts uh, coming from intelligence sources that are that are reported uh, in, in, in the media. There are already 3,000 North Korean troops uh, that are uh, brought forward and being trained and transported to to the front. Now, whether they will remain in Russia or whether they will be used as combat troops in Ukraine remains to be seen. At this stage, there were some uh, you know photographs coming out um, that North Korean troops being killed in Kursk uh, in Russia uh, as a part of that operation. So a couple of things are clear there. They are not just technical um, support engineers, et cetera, that would provide support for the North Korean ammunitions and ballistic missiles and other things that North Korea has been providing um, to, to Russia, but actual combat troops that will be used. So they're fundamentally North Korean mercenaries that is provided by, by, the, by the North Korean regime. Now, it is concerning because, um, not only because this, the North Korea have a, a relatively vast, you know, sort of reservoir of of troops that they can um, they can provide, which will reduce the political pressures on Vladimir Putin in terms of mobilization and diverting more resources uh, for the war effort, which already you know, puts strain on on the Russian economy, Russian production outside the war effort, etc. So this will provide some sort of a reprieve as well as political less costly domestically, uh, but also. On the other side of it, 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 it also provides North Korea, you know, ability to test their military, test their uh, weapons. And this concerns, of course, our, our South Korean allies, clearly, as well as what Russians are providing in return. You know, advanced uh, uh, technology uh, in terms of ballistic missiles, higher, better uh, sensing uh, equipment and, and uh, support, intelligence support, support for their uh, nuclear program. What is being provided? in return for not only roughly 3 million shells that North Korea provided to Russia this year, which is the, equal, the, the, the amount equal to Russians themselves producing, but also now troops. So this is basically North Korea helping Russia invade a European country. And, and now we will have the troops fighting there. So it has, I think, important ramifications, both for war in Ukraine, but also peace and stability in, in, the, in the Korean Peninsula. When I was putting my notes together for this interview, I was checking to see how long this conflict had been going on for. Um, Two weeks from today, when this is airing, it will hit its 1,000th day. Is it surprising to you to see uh, this conflict drag on for so long, to see uh, Ukraine being able to hold out for this long, or uh, even Russia's refusal to back down as they've kind of continually been turned away? To me, it, unfortunately, it is not surprising. And it is in, in, in your show, I think back in April 2022, when we talked about this, I said that we shouldn't think about this war as the first Gulf War, like a six weeks a war, but we should think about Iran-Iraq war uh, that lasted eight years. And uh, given that the, the, the Ukrainians managed to stop the, the blitzkrieg to Kiev in the initial weeks and months of the, uh, of the war, um, I was expecting this to go on for a while, and unfortunately, this is uh, this remains the case. I mean, there are multiple reasons for it. The the primary reason is, of course, uh, Ukrainians, uh, you know, courage and bravery in in terms of defending their home and hearth, uh, but also after you know weeks of of dithering the Western support and ammunition coming through, enabling Ukrainians to defend, and and Russia making a big, big I mean, miscalculation in terms of how fast they can they can move and, and what is the support that they thought they had in Eastern Ukraine, which, of course, uh, was mostly a fiction. 
So yes, unfortunately, I'm not surprised. This is also in line with historical war um, development. Um, as we talked before, wars tend to last either, most wars last few days to few weeks. A few of them that goes beyond those timelines tend to last years. So it's a bimodal distribution mostly. And we're already beyond that. So we, I am expecting this war, unfortunately, in some form or another to, to, to go in another 12, 18, 24 months uh, before uh, we can see the, the end of the tunnel. And again, at one calculation, this war has been going on for 10 years. Uh, if you go back to 2014 and the, uh, and the annexation of Crimea and invasion of Eastern Ukraine. So we are already in a, in a multi-year, perhaps a multi-decade war in Europe. And it, we will remain in that position regardless of whether there will be a temporary pause in this particular phase of the conflict soon. One of the things that Trump and his surrogates have said a lot in relation to Ukraine is that there's no point continuing to give them so much money because they can't win this war. Is there a path to victory uh, for Ukraine, assuming perhaps a, a Harris administration, that would actually not keep this conflict going on for another two, three years? Like, is that opportunity still on the table, I guess? I think there is. It is a narrow path. Uh, but it exists, and that window of opportunity might end up closing soon enough uh, for two reasons. One, despite the massive resources that Russia you know, brings to bear on this conflict, including support uh, from North Korea and China and, and Iran, their resources are not unlimited. And those who are supporting Russia would have their own red lines, would have their own uh, calculations to what extent they are willing to provide military support, um, financial support by buying Russian resources, etc. And there is a limit in which you can transform your economy into a war economy and continue to shield the vast majority of the public from the effects, economic and social effects of that war. So there is a, a limit to how long Russia can also continue this war. Uh, when you look at the on, the on the other side, the second thing, is that the, the, the West, I mean, Europe is, is 10 times larger than the Russian, uh, Russian economy in, in terms of capacity. If you include, you know, uh, United States, Canada, Japan, South Korea, we're talking about 20 times larger in terms of the capacity to do things. What we are lacking is the political will. So we do have a, a pathway, and that pathway goes through uh, lifting restrictions on Ukraine's ability to strike everywhere uh, all the legitimate military targets uh, in Russia, providing them with everything they need at a scale that they need, not drip, 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 providing the support too little, too late, giving the Russians an opportunity to adjust. And, and, the, and the fundamental thing, and this is a brutal truth and, and it's not nice to hear, uh, but the, the road to a Ukrainian victory goes through providing Ukrainians the ability to kill as many Russian troops as possible while destroying as many, as much of Russian uh, equipment, weapons, and ammunition as possible so that it changes the calculation in Kremlin. When Putin decides that the costs are too high domestically, internationally, this war will end and we can help Ukraine get there. But that requires a, a proper rearmament uh, of the West for our defense and for Ukraine's defense. As I have been saying for years, this is not charity. This is self-interest for us. We need to be able to realize that we are at war, whether we like it or not, because that's how Kremlin thinks. This is not, in, 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 in Putin's mind, only a war in Ukraine against Ukraine, but this is a war against the West. We're still trying to pursue it through the, the, the times of uh, policies of, of peacetime. We need to ramp up, and if we do bring bear the, our, our economic might and our ability to outproduce uh, Russia uh, in this war, there is a, a, a pathway to victory. It's not easy, but the not acting, the cost of inaction and dithering is a lot, lot higher uh, than whatever the short-term costs of ramping up uh, our defense production and giving what Ukraine what it needs. 
Well, the last thing that I want to ask you about is, and I think you kind of just alluded uh, to it there, is what is the biggest concern here beyond uh, the U.S. election and continued support for Ukraine? Is this that we are in uh, a larger conflict than we actually believe we are in now? What will you be watching for in the next little while, regardless of who wins the election? Regardless of who wins the election, what I am very much concerned is the uh, continuing political instability in the United States with a deadlock government, rival claims to who won the election, and increasing polarization in the United States that makes American public and the politicians turn uh, even more inward and therefore providing more space, creating a vacuum uh, in, in the international system for our adversaries to step up and fill in. This not only includes Russia, but also China and Iran and others, as the United States increasingly deal with the, the, the consequences of a domestic polarization and a deadlock system and rival claims to a contested election, if that comes to pass, that will provide the opportunity for others to push forward. And neither Canada nor, unfortunately, our European allies are at this stage ready to fill that void. I think Europeans are waking up, but not fast enough. Uh, there are still concerns when it comes to Germany and other Western European countries that they do not understand the, uh, the, the reality of the situation. And here at home, unfortunately, we seem to lack any sense of urgency on how uh, and why this matters to us and the world, world change. So I am concerned about this inward-looking, navel-gazing attitude uh, that, that would give no bandwidth for the policymakers in the West to deal with an increasing threat of a, a, a much, uh, much broader conflict around the world, and our adversaries are taking advantage of that. That is my primary concern right now. Well, Ken, as always, thank you so much for uh, your time and for uh, walking us through this. And I think, you know, the eyes of the world have been elsewhere for a while, but uh, it, it's good to learn uh, what's at risk right now. Well, thank you very much. It's always uh, a pleasure uh, to be in the show. Balkan Devlin of the McDonald Laurier Institute and Good Judgment Incorporated. That was The Big Story. For more from us, you can head to thebigstorypodcast.ca. You can always shoot us some feedback by emailing hello at thebigstorypodcast.ca or by calling us and leaving a voicemail at 416-935-5935. You can find The Big Story in your favorite podcast player, and of course, on your smart speaker when you ask it to play The Big Story Podcast. If you ever feel like leaving us a rating or a review in any of those podcast players, we see them all. They are always appreciated. Thanks for listening. I'm Jordan Heath-Rawlings. We'll talk tomorrow.